my perspective is one of a nanotechnologist, not even a toxicologist, but somebody who's actually been in this field um, actually my entire academic career, and really looking at ways of using nanomaterials to solve problems. And about 2000, 2001, we got into the area at Rice University of what about the environmental and human health implications of those technologies. And so a group of primarily nanotechnologists at Rice, um, as well as biomedical engineers as an, and environmental engineers, um, began to work that problem. And at the same time, uh, NSF Center at Rice began, the Center for Biological and Environmental Nanotech. And that center has really driven a lot of applications research and also some implications research as well. And so um, what I'll talk to you about today is actually kind of my title, Safety by Design, but also just some general comments. It's late in the day. I took as many slides out as I could. <laughs> so hopefully there'll be some space for discussion. But I think why I'm so interested in hearing about risk communication is as I've gotten into this area, I've realized that the impact of the technical information that my lab and others can, gener can generate is very much dependent on our ability to communicate it in a way that I have never experienced before in science where I'm usually trying to make a widget. If you're trying to make information that's going to inform policy, how you do that, that sort of end of that pipeline is really critical. So I don't really understand how it works, but I'll tell you my perspectives. Um, so since this isn't just about nanotechnology, but it's also about um, generally emerging technologies, let me just give you the sort of reason why we began to think about this topic uh, many years ago. So one of the features of nanoscale materials, and you're looking at the top at three micro microscopic images of them, three different types, is that they have really bizarre properties when they're made on the nanoscale. Some, some folks, especially in industry, like to say, ah, it's all been done before. And at some level, all of science and all of human intellectual pursuits have been done before. Um, but what makes nanotechnology really different is probably the fact that in the 1980s, we began to see nanoscale features and began to understand a lot of the technologies we made already we're utilizing the fact that on the nanoscale, things are very different. They're different from a magnetic point of view. My lab works a lot with magnetic systems. They're different from a chemical point of view. They can, gold, when it's very small, is incredibly reactive. It can do oxidative chemistry. You're not going to have, you know, on your wedding ring. Uh, and finally, you can have very, very different colors, optical signatures that are very unique. And those unique properties really span a lot of interesting uh, sort of physics and engineering issues. So it was kind of natural to say, well, heck, if they're unique by chemical and physical properties, what about biological properties? I don't know how this works. So I'm just going to do this. Great. And that was really the essence of the question, is how much of that, especially the chemical properties, would translate to the biological world. So this question was raised by nanotechnologists. And what we realized, especially very quickly after 2001, was that uncertainty about their risks was actually a bottleneck for us to transfer our technologies. Now, if you're working on a functional imaging agent, which is something my lab does, that is supposed to go into somebody's body and report back if a tumor is a, one of those slow-growing tumors or a really fast-growing tumor, Risk is part of that because that's how the FDA is going to look at your material. They're going to ask you to tell you what are the risks. So that's kind of embedded in bioengineering. Environmental engineering as well. If you're trying to make a better water filtration system, you're going to have to confront issues of risk from a technical point of view. But what was striking to us was as we talked to companies, how many of them were concerned about these larger social rejection of the whole technology because of our difficulty with managing this question. So we really saw it as a big roadblock. And in fact, industry was one of the reasons that the center started to really look and actually spend a little bit more money. Currently, our center, which is about $3 million a year, is 70% applications and 30% implications research. Um, and that was very much driven by our program managers at NSF early on. But certainly, what we've seen is a growth and a sort of generation of this new set of questions in the technical world. So that's really where we started. And so what I'm going to do today is talk a little bit about proactive risk research, because I've been doing it now for, I guess, seven or eight years. And I know now it wasn't that proactive, because there were certainly consumer stuff, materials on the market that are nano. But I want to give you the arguments for why I think it's a bit different. Um, and it may be true for any emerging technology, but there are some issues with nanotech that make it somewhat unique, I think. I'll move on to safety by design, define that, give you one example. Finally, just sort of my personal experience about communicating about our information and some of the challenges I see. And maybe they'll all be familiar, and you'll tell me how to overcome them, which will be wonderful. <laughs> OK, so the first challenge in doing 
risk research before you have a technology is actually shown in this graph, which one of the earlier speakers talked about some of the studies and the different people who projected the size of these markets. What we did is we got these studies, we averaged their numbers, and we made this graph. Um, one of the interesting things about it is that all of these different studies and analysts agree this thing is going to exponentially grow. I mean, we're at the beginning of it taking off. Uh, you know, they may vary. There's a fairly high error bar as you got to 2020, but they all agree it's going to really, really grow. So one of the challenges then, if you're sitting especially here, <laughs> to doing actual go into a lab and what's going to happen if, if you have a, an exposure of a nanoparticle, is to actually figure out what your exposure is going to be. Because while you know there's a big market, what exactly will that entail? So this is just one, uh, I give an intro to nano uh, class. And one of the things I do is I have like a photo album of all the different nanoparticles that we go through. And this is just one page of that album. Um, there are hundreds of different classes of nanomaterials. You can have carbon materials, which behave one way. You can have quantum dots. You can have metal oxides, the magnetic materials, gold. You can have organic nanostructures. And they can be etched into the surface and be something entirely different. So one of the challenges right away is if you're being proactive, which you can pat yourself on the back, you're trying to understand the technical data early, what do you study? If you're presented with this entire zoo full of nanomaterials, it costs a lot of money to go into the studies, which one of these are you going to pick? And one of the problems is, does anybody think all those experts who agree on the size of the market, if you go and read it, you will read thousands of different opinions about which nanomaterial and which application will actually constitute that market. There is zero agreement. That's kind of like a crystal ball in the future. Some people say it's cerium oxide and diesel fuel. Other people say it's nanomedicine. Other people say it's carbon nanotube composites. And you know they all have their various reasons. But there is no crystal ball for what this market is going to look like. So if you decide, you know, one solution is to look backwards. OK, what's on the market now? Well, we know TiO2 is on the market in sunscreen. So then you go and invest a whole bunch in that. But that doesn't necessarily have any relationship to what you're going to be facing in the next 10 years. So one of the challenges of proactive risk research is precisely what do you choose to study. And it gets really much more complicated because as a chemist, I'm very proud of the fact that let's say we decide single-walled nanotubes. That's the one we're going to pick just because it's you know, lots of very hot area. OK, I can make you at least 100,000 different types, different chiralities, different surfaces, you know, different lengths. And so, in fact, this is a conversation I've had with toxicologists about, is a single wall nanotube toxic? And there's some actual toxicology data, typical sort of LC50 graph. The problem is that was for a single nanotube. And I have the ability to change it in any way and modify it in any way I want. So that's another challenge. Not only do you choose a class, you can modify it and alter it in some fundamental ways. And just when you thought that was hard, what about exposure? Lots of you have already sort of highlighted the fact that hazard is one measure, which is what you might do in the first toxicology experiment. Problem is, you know, are you going to be focusing on inhalation of the workers? Are you going to be thinking about direct consumer contact? Or what about the eco impacts? So you put all of that together. It's great to come early and do risk-based research. I think it's incredibly important. But we really don't know how to handle all of the different parameter space that we're going to be going into. And in fact, I would argue that the old models for risk assessment, which are in the technical world, are designed for a single substance in a specific use setting where you have a lot of information and you just go and drill down. It's classic quantitative risk assessment. There's a lot of different models and different ways you can do it, but it's very specific. What we actually need is something that's more like a risk landscape. We need research, I believe, that lets us handle the fact that I could make a billion different types of materials. And I could make a lot of different technologies that use them. And if you look at this, it's the difference between a risk assessment and a risk forecast. So I proposed for a while, and we're working on it, Rice, actual computational tools that would help us map this out. And I actually just downloaded this from the web, which is why I kind of want to get home tomorrow, <laughs> among other reasons. Um, and a lot of folks say you could never, ever build computational models that would help you characterize. And I'm going to talk about the part of risk that you all think about, but just say, is it going to kill a rat? Is it going to have an effect on an ecosystem? And I would say that the tools we have now make that very possible. The weather models that go into predicting if this hurricane is going to hit my, my city or not are not perfect and, in fact, still influence policy. And the public accepts them and uses them.